Welcome to Victory Church. My name is Jason Eckle. I'm the executive pastor here at Victory. We are so honored that you would join us and experience God with us today. I want to invite you to let us know you're here and let us know how we can pray for you by filling out the Smart Connect card. The prompts are right now at the bottom of the screen. Let me take a minute right now and pray for us as we watch today. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We pray blessings on everyone watching, Lord, and we just are so excited that we get a chance to worship you today. Please be with us throughout our day today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant.
Ancient prophecies found in Scripture and fulfilled in Christ give us faith for today and hope for the future. Because with God, promises made are promises kept. Welcome to the season of Advent. Welcome, Victory Church. I want to welcome all who are here with us in this service, and also a welcome to everybody who is watching online. And we are continuing our series on Promises Kept, and it's built around our Christmas Eve service, which includes an, alter an alternation between scripture readings and songs. And the scripture readings start with some of the prophecies made about Jesus all the way back in the Old Testament. And today, we're once again going to Genesis. This time, Genesis chapter 22. And if you look at the heading in the NIV, it says that this section is Abraham tested. Abraham tested. But I want to submit that there are really two tests going on, especially in the minds of the readers or in the minds of the original participants in this story. And so we start with Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2. God has been dealing with Abraham for a little while now, and so it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Now, obviously, Abraham is being put to a tremendous test here. Is he going to obey God with this huge command that God has given to him? But th there's another test, and the other test is this. Will God prove himself faithful to his promises? And that's not that Abraham is putting God to the test or that we're putting God to the test, but God is in some ways putting himself to the test. He is putting himself in a position where we might raise a question, is God going to fulfill his promises? Will God prove himself capable of fulfilling his promises? Does he have the character and the capacity to do it in light of what he has just asked Abraham to do? First of all, we might even ask about God. Has God gone nuts? Now, I know that sounds very disrespectful to the Lord. My father-in-law used to say, uh, Ed, God is weird. Say, Don, don't say that about God. <laughs> he said, no, God does strange and wonderful and marvelous things. And like, okay, if you put it that way, it's, it's okay. But, you know, th this is kind of crazy, even in light of that kind of statement, because, you know, God, it, it shows in Scripture, he hates human sacrifice. He hates the shedding of innocent blood. That was established right at the beginning. And now he's asking for Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And, you know, as we work through this passage, we'll see that there are no emotions described in all of this, in spite of, you know, the, the tension that has to be set up in, in Abraham's mind and in that family. There, there are no emotions mentioned except in this one verse where it says, you know, this is your only son. Not necessarily that he was the only offspring at this point of Abraham, but he's the only one through whom God's promises were made. And he's the son that Isaac, he, he, Isaac is your son that you love. 
your son that you love. And, and you know, it, it just seems like to be asked, for God to ask Abraham to sacrifice him is just crazy. And, and not, not only that, but it, it kind of seems a little crazy given the fact that God has made some tremendous promises about Isaac. So how, how can Abraham kill Isaac if God has made these? Is God capable of keeping these promises such as he made when he first encountered Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 12? Right from the get-go, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. It says, the Lord had said to Abram. He hadn't changed his name to Abraham yet. Same guy, though, okay? The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. <laughs> That's kind of putting Abraham to the test a little bit. Leave all that... You know, leave your family, leave your country, and go somewhere that, that I'm not even going to tell you yet. Go to the place I'm going to show you. And then verse 2, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Uh, it sounds like God is a God of blessing, amen? How many times was that word used in those three verses? And, you know, the great nation that God is establishing through Abraham is Israel. A lot in the news lately, right? God loves Israel. God made a promise to Abraham regarding his descendants, Israel. His descendants through Isaac. Israel, the country, the nation, the great nation of Israel. And can I just say God still loves Israel? <laughs> These words that he will bless those who bless Israel, curse those who curse Israel, those words still apply. They do. And, you know, does that mean that we have to agree with everything that national Israel does? No. There's room for political dialogue. Even within the nation of Israel, people have different viewpoints. But I can tell you that a lot of what we're hearing in the news and what we're seeing on college campuses and in other places is on the wrong side of God's plan for the nation of Israel. And I would just urge caution because history has shown that you know the forces that want to curse Israel to annihilate Israel are not on God's side. And we have to be very careful about playing into the hands of a spiritual enemy who would love to see God's plan through Israel totally abolished. So, God intends to create a great nation through Abraham, and specifically, as we would see if we were to read in the next several chapters, specifically through Isaac. And so, uh, God is in some ways being tested here because, you know, he's made these promises, will he keep them? Can we count on God to keep his promises? But in the context of this particular story, the, the question is, will Abraham pass the test? Will Abraham pass the test? And uh, what Abraham does has a lot to do with how we perceive of God. So what happens with Abraham? Notice when, when, when God speaks to Abraham, Abraham has a three-word response. Hear I am. Here I am. I, I, I think that's amazing. And, and in fact, in the entire passage having to do with God asking I, Abraham to sacrifice Isaac and all that happens afterwards, Abraham only speaks to God twice. Man, if God's telling me to sacrifice my child, God and I are going to have a conversation. <laughs> but... but Abraham says, here am I. And then later on, the angel of the Lord, pre-incarnate Christ, God, speaks to Abraham again, and Abraham has the same three-word response, here I am. N not even a yes, Lord, not even an okay, Lord, not, not a question, just here I am. It's all that Abraham has to say to God. 
I remember hearing somebody say one time, this is early in my walk with the Lord, God is not looking for your ability. He is looking for your availability. And with regard to Abraham, he was available. Here I am. Here I am, God. I'm available. And I I believe some of the most faith-filled words we could ever speak to God are simply the words, here I am. Here I am. Isaiah, here I am. Send me. Here I am. Are you available to God? That's a good question that all of us could ask. Abraham was available. And no other words to God, no arguments, no expression of emotions, no, no questions about how or why, just here I am. And then what do we see next on the part of Abraham? Not words, not emotions, not discussions, not talking with his wife, not even talking with Isaac. What we see is action. Not even a yes, Lord, I'll obey. I, I, I like saying yes to the Lord. But Abraham doesn't even say that. He just moves into action, and he doesn't dilly-dally. Verse 3, Genesis 22, verses 3 and 4. Early the next morning, the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he's not messing around. He's planning on sacrificing his son as a burnt offering. He set out for the place God had told him about. He knew the region, didn't know the mountain. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Now he sees the mountain. Notice early in the morning. Early in the morning. We, can you, we don't know what happened with Abraham between this conversation with God, this receiving the word of the Lord and just saying, here I am. We don't, we don't know what I, I, can, you, can you imagine how sleepless he might have been that night? Can you imagine the turmoil that he might have faced? We don't know what he said to Sarah. Can you imagine that conversation? You're going to take my son? I don't know. He doesn't know where he's going. He knows he's going to the region of Moriah. He doesn't know the specific mountain. God said... At the beginning, in in the first couple of verses we read, go to the place, the mountain, I will show you. Abram had had heard similar words before, hadn't he? And we read those words, leave your country, leave your people, and go to the place, I will show you. That had to stir up a lot of of trauma. I mean, if you want to think about it that way, I mean, God had already cut Abraham off from his past. God had already cut Abraham off from all that had been familiar to him, his land, his country, his family, to go. And God still had not given him the land that had been promised. So God has cut off his past, and now he's made promises about his future, and it looks like God's going to cut him off from that too. Folks, I would be having a conversation with God. I would be saying a little bit more. But we just see Abraham acting. He does what God tells him to do. Apparently, he doesn't spend a lot of time pondering the situation. He packs up his supplies. He cuts some wood. You know why he cut the wood? He had to get a little bit of energy out, you know? I don't know. He just he had to he had to do what he had to do to get ready to make the sacrifice, and uh, he has to get ready for a three day journey. He, he doesn't he doesn't say, well, it'll take me a couple of days to get everything ready. He does immediately what God wants him to do. So we just have to speculate about emotions and conversations and all that. But there's one thing about Abraham. Besides the action that we don't have to speculate about, what is that? His faith. (laughs) We don't know about his emotions or anything else, but we do know about his faith. And we get a glimpse of it in 
this journey. And it says in verse 5, Genesis 22, 5, he said to his servants, after he looks up and he sees the place, he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. And then hear, hear these words. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Now, is he trying to deceive the, ser the servants? I don't think so. I think what he is demonstrating is what we see in the rest of this passage. He is showing faith in God. And, and you know, at this point in the story, the way we read it right through here in the original story in Genesis, we, again, don't have any clue what is going through his mind, what kind of emotions, what, you know, you know he, he's thinking, what he's surmising, what he is reckoning might happen. We don't know from this passage right here. We just know that he's making a statement, we're going to be back. We're going to be back. He doesn't even say, well, I don't know how it's going to work out or whatever, but he just says, we're going to be back. Not a whole lot of words again. We're going to be back. Abraham has faith that he and Isaac will return because he knows that God has made promises. And so the journey continues. Now he's traveled along with his son Isaac. So verses 6 and 7, same chapter. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Again, not a whole lot of talk. Nothing about the emotions of the moment. Nothing about the emotions of Isaac. I mean, he carries the wood for his own sacrifice while his father has the fire and the knife with which he would kill Isaac. And he just has a logical question. Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? Think about your own family. Think about your own life when we're asked to do something that is sacrificial, especially pertaining to our kids and our family. I think about the fact that our first child, Haley, who you know from leading worship here, uh, she chose to go to college not just on the other side of the state, but on the other side of the world, Australia. And, uh, you know, we decided that since, you know, she's only 18 or whatever age she was when she went, maybe 17, that, uh, you know, it would be probably good if I, as her dad, went along with her, took a couple extra suitcases for her, got her established in her apartment there, got her situated, and then, you know, I could leave her there and, you know, kind of rest easy about that. So uh, I went the last day that I was there, time for me to come home. Uh, Haley was at a chapel or something like that, and she came out to say goodbye to me because I was on my way to the airport. And, you know, she seemed a little bit eager for me to leave. Uh, and I probably just teared up a little bit, but it was a, you know, just a good farewell, and I got in the car, went to the airport, and 24 hours to come home. I mean, the, the flight is just horrendous from uh, Sydney, Australia to Philadelphia, long flight. At the time, from Sydney to Dallas was the longest uh, flight, domestic flight, not domestic flight, but uh, passenger flight in the world. I think it changes a little bit, but you get the idea. But I was fine. It was fine, you know, just, I'm Pentecostal, so I'm sure I didn't watch any movies. Uh, <laughs> <k> kidding. <laughs> uh, but got home, you know, got, you know, picked up at the airport by my wife and got home and walked into the house 
And I remember going back to the bedroom, and it was dark in there, and all of a sudden it hit me. Haley's not with me. <laughs> she, and I'm not going to see her for a long time. And I, I just sat on my bed and sobbed. I cried like a baby. And I hadn't done that in years. And I haven't done it since then. But I, I was just bawling my eyes out. And yet you look at Abraham here, you don't see any of that. All you see on the part of Abraham is what? Faith. Faith. <laughs> and, and, you know, so what does he respond to Isaac? Not, oh, son, I'm so sorry. You're the sacrifice. No, that's not what he says. He says in verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Abraham had faith. He told the servants, we're going to be back. And then he tells Isaac, when Isaac asks him about the lamb, which wasn't there, which actually he was, at least in Abraham's mind, Abraham's mind. And yet, what does Abraham say? God himself will provide the lamb. Abraham has faith. And just think about this, though. And you can read the previous chapters about Abraham. Faith is not something that Abraham is just now coming into. Folks, can I just tell you, when you're going through a trial, when you're going through a difficulty, when you're going through a test, whatever the source of that test, whether it's a problem in life or it's a medical issue or anything else, the test time is not the time to begin developing your faith. <laughs> So Abraham had already developed a lot of faith. He had enough faith to leave the country and go to a land. He didn't know what it was going to be. And there he encountered God. I mean, that was one of the great things about where he was when God spoke to him. Beersheba, it was a place of really meeting with God continuously and, and it just amazing. And, and then, you know, he messes up a couple of times. He, he gets ahead of God. Sometimes we get a promise from the Lord, and we come up with our own way of fulfilling that promise, right? And Abraham and Sarah did that, so he's not perfect, but he had faith. He believed that when God said to him that his descendants were going to be like the stars in the sky, he believed. He believed the Lord. He believed God when God said, you're 100 years old, but you're going to have a baby. And your wife is 90 years old, around 90. She's going to have a baby. The Apostle Paul says that Abraham was as good as dead. That's, I know that's not politically correct for senior citizens, you know. <laughs> but, but that's what Paul said, that Abraham was as good as dead and, and Sarah's womb was dead, yet he believed God. And so then when God said, your offspring are going to be like the stars in the sky, if you can even count them, which you probably can't, that's the way your offspring is going to be. Genesis 15, 6, and it says, here, here's the response. Abraham believed the Lord, and God credited it to him as righteousness. <laughs> Why was Abraham seen as righteous before God? Because he believed God. And, and you know what? That's the entire basis for Abraham's relationship with God. That's the entire basis for Abraham's righteousness, his right standing with God. And Paul quotes this in Romans chapter 4 to let us know that our right standing with God is on the same basis, and that is faith in God. God will keep promises. <laughs> Isaac and I, were going to be back, servants. Isaac... God will provide the sacrifice. We can trust in God. Our right standing with God, it, it produces action. Our, our faith in God will give us such confidence in God that we'll, we'll, we'll try, we'll do anything for the Lord, right? Yes. So our faith produces action, but our right standing with God is just, we believe God, and it's counted to us as righteousness. And 
our faith is, is totally wrapped up in the same thing that, that ultimately Abraham's faith is wrapped up in. Our faith is wrapped up in that statement that we just read from Abraham when he responded to Isaac. Our faith is based on this, this truth, this eternal truth promised way back then, God will provide the lamb. God will provide the lamb. Did, did Abraham believe that God would provide a lamb who would be the substitute for his son Isaac? Maybe so. Let's think about Isaac just a little bit more. He is the sacrifice. He's not the star of the show in Genesis 22. The star of the show is, well, God, of course, but Abraham. This is about Abraham's faith. But he does have a question that Abraham answers with faith. And other than that question, we don't see any protests, no emotions, not, not even a description of his cooperation. Well, how, how, did, how did Abraham get him to carry the wood? How did Abraham get him to lie down on the altar? How did Abraham get him not to fight back? How did Abraham keep him from stealing the knife and stabbing Abraham? I mean, we can ask all those kinds of questions. The Bible doesn't say anything about it. All you see is that he goes along with it. The promised son, who Isaac is, the promised son who would be a blessing to all nations, the source of that blessing that God had promised, represents none other than the son of promise through whom all nations are blessed. And that's Jesus. Well, you see some parallels here, don't you? I mean, it, it says about Jesus in Isaiah that he was like a lamb led to the slaughter, just silent. That's Jesus. That's Isaac. And so, you know, again, we have to speculate a little bit, but he must have had tremendous faith in his father. Tremendous trust in his father. And Hebrews tells us about Abraham. Hebrews eleven nineteen. 19. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. You get that? Abraham believed that if he obeyed God and sacrificed Isaac, that God was so true to his promises that if Isaac were sacrificed, God was going to raise him from the dead. And maybe Isaac believed it too. So what happens? Does God raise him from the dead? Does God intervene? What's going to happen here? A lot of you know the story, but man, uh, somebody who's hearing this story for the first time, there's some suspense here. Is God able is God able? Is, is God able to keep his promise? So let's keep reading. Genesis 22, verse 9. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Man, Isaac had some, some time to escape. <laughs> he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And you already know what Abraham replies because I already pointed it out. Here I am. The only thing you hear Abraham say to the angel of the Lord, the only thing you hear him say to God, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me, your son, your only son. And then Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. For us Pentecostals and Charismatics, 
Jehovah Jireh. Amen? Amen. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Let me ask you, did Abraham pass the test? Absolutely. Does God pass the test? He is true to his promises. <laughs> I just love it. He, he, he stops the sacrifice just at the last moment. And just affirms Abraham's love for God, his fear of the Lord, his faith, and then provides the sacrifice that is the substitute for Abraham's son. Man, those, this is, these are real powerful lessons in faith. This is how faith operates. Abraham's such a powerful example. But you know, this is not really about Abraham. Not ultimately. It's about you. And I'm not trying to get, you know, too hyper-individualistic. But I'm saying God's plans through Abraham and Isaac and this great nation was not just about Abraham, Isaac, and the great nation. God's plan was about all nations on earth being blessed, and that includes you. This story is about you. And if God was faithful to Abraham, and God's faithful to Isaac, and he did provide the sacrifice, I can promise you God will be faithful and has been faithful to you. God passes the test every time. Every time. Every time. God is keeping his promise. So the Lord speaks again. We saw from Genesis chapter 12 the initial promise that he made to Abraham, and now God is doubling down. Genesis 22, verses 15 through 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky and, the, and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And, you know, look how Paul links this to the story of the gospel. This is the story of the good news of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. That's you and me. If we are people of faith in God too. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. And announce the gospel. So this story about Abraham and Isaac is the gospel. God is announcing the gospel in advance to Abraham, saying, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. <laughs> God has passed the test, and we're the beneficiaries. We are the ones who've been brought into the family of God. We are descendants of Abraham through the same way Abraham came into right standing with God. He believed God and God credited to him as righteousness. Mm. If you've never put your trust in Jesus, now's the time because God is faithful. God is faithful. You know, sometimes we don't understand why he asked what he asked for. Sometimes we don't understand why he does what he does. We don't understand why God would choose the Jewish people to bring salvation to the whole world. A lot of the animosity against the Jewish people, folks, is really animosity against the sovereignty of God. Yes. That was God who chose that. You can say, well, you know, aren't all people just the same? Well, God chose Israel. That's the way that he brought salvation. Jesus was born into the earthly family of Abraham. Amen. And God still has a plan. Amen. But God is faithful. And so if, if God is that faithful, you know, 
In fact, you could even say, look at the fact that after 2,000 years, God reconstituted the nation of Israel. God's faithful to his promises, folks. He's faithful to his promises. And he'll be faithful to you. And he's provided the sacrifice, who is Jesus. Would you say yes to Jesus? I want to give you a chance to pray if you're here or you're watching and you've never prayed to receive Christ. Repeat these words after me. Pray them from your heart. Let's all pray it out loud together to encourage those who are praying this for the first time. Say these words. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I believe Jesus died. He was raised from the dead. And he is Lord. Forgive me of all my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Help me live for you. Help me trust in you with my entire life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. If you prayed that, welcome to the family of God. God looks at your faith right now, and he credits that to you as righteousness, right standing with him, the same basis upon which Abraham had right standing with God. Now, if you prayed that prayer, make sure you let us know. Just indicate on your Smart Connect card or whatever means of, of connecting with us through the media you're watching on and let us know. We want to walk with you. We want to stand with you. And if you're here in the room, make sure you indicate on your Connect card that you made that decision for Christ. But believers, I want to talk to you just a little bit because not only do we get into right standing by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, but we are to live by faith. We are to live by faith, the same kind of faith that Abraham dem demonstrated. It's not just the way to get saved and then we just live you know, any way that we want to. We want to live by faith in God, and we want to live by the faith that, that when God asks us to do something, we're going to do it. When God says, say something, we're going to say it. When God says give something, we're going to give it. We're going to do what God says to do because we trust that anything we commit to him, just as, as Abraham was willing to commit to Isaac, God's going to give it back to us one way or another. We're, we're going to come back and worship God. We're not going to be diminished. We're not going to be losing out when we act on the same kind of faith that Abraham acted on. This is something that God is calling us to do. Matthew 16, 25 says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Man, when we give up life, when we just die to self on a daily basis, we get life back and all the more because God is faithful. He's true. He passes the test every time. So, we live in the blessings, and we stay in that place of blessing. Remember how many times God said, I'm going to bless, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless your descendants, I'm going to bless all nations, all nations are going to be blessed through you. I mean, that word bless, God is a blessing God. That's part of our trust in him. He is a God of blessing. He's faithful to his promises, he keeps his promises, and he desires to bless and I trust that whatever I give up for the Lord, he's able to give it back to me somehow. And, you know, that, that calls for sacrificial living. And in our day and age, if we're going to be Christians, you know, just this, you know, kind of just easy Christianity, we're, we're going to talk about God's Sabbath rest. So I'm not talking about striving in our own strength and flesh. But the idea that, that, that we could just live a life that, that fails to, to die to self daily and to honor God, to sacrificial living. I mean, I mean, uh, um, America needs Christians who believe like Abraham. Just here I am. Here I am. And I want to live in the constant awareness that the Lord Himself provided the sacrifice. The Lord himself was the sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And we're going to observe that in the Lord's Supper in just a couple of minutes. But one thing that you probably missed out on in the service so far, anybody know what we haven't?
talked about? Your giving. And we're in the season of joyful generosity. And, and I, I want to ask you this. Do, do we apply the same faith and trust in God that what we put into his hands, he's able to take care of and will not be diminished? And I'm not promising, you know, just a monetary, you know, give this and get a certain amount of money back. But I am saying that God is faithful when he asks us to make sacrifices for him, for his glory, so that the nations can be blessed, so that people will be blessed. Will we give what God asks? See, our offerings represent our trust that God is still passing the test. And in fact, in, in the area of giving is one place, the one place where God says, test me in this and bring the whole tithe and see if I'm not going to pour out a blessing that you don't have room enough to contain. And folks, we need to be the kind of church, we need to kind of be the kind of people who have so much blessing, we can't contain it, but it just spills out of our lives into the world around us. See, our giving represents our sacrifice. Now, did, didn't Jesus die so that we don't have to sacrifice? No. He, he died and gave us the example of dying to self and picking up the cross. And, you know, just as Jesus obeyed, as Abraham obeyed, we obey and do whatever God asks us to do. When, when I was in seminary, I did a mission trip to Mexico City, and I led a young neighborhood boy to the Lord. He was about 15 or 16 years old, Luis. And, uh, you know, we talked about Scripture all the time. He was just so hungry. And on my last day in Mexico City, Luis was at the house where I was staying, and he said, Ed, I want you to do one thing for me. I said, what's that? He said, I want you to give me your jacket. I had this brand new jacket that I'd bought at the Liverpool department store in Mexico City. It was so cool. It was cotton. It was gray. It was white. It was so cool. I, I was so excited to, you know, go back home and wear this super cool jacket that I'd bought. And now Luis asked me for my jacket. You know, and, and I know I've, I've got to give it to him, so I take it off. And, eh, here's my jacket. And I didn't have a very good attitude. And Luis noticed that, and he said, does that make you mad that I asked for your jacket? Oh, well, here it is. He said, no, you can have it. So I was kind of glad that I got it back. But that's not the end of the story because within hours, within a day or two, remember I said it was cotton and had, you know, white and gray, it was real stylish. I spilled coffee on that jacket. It was ruined. It was, the, it, the stain was not going to come out. So now I was ashamed. I was ashamed of the jacket and I was ashamed that I didn't give it to Luis. Because now the jacket wasn't a blessing to anybody. But if I had given that jacket to Luis, it would have been a blessing to me that I would have never lost. I would have never lost that blessing of giving to this young follower of Jesus and demonstrating the, the generosity of God. And I want to encourage you, give what God is asking you to give. Because if you don't, you're likely to spill coffee on it <laughs> or to spend it on something that, you know, won't last. But if you give to God what he's asking you to give, and for joyful generosity, we're talking about over and above giving, over and above our regular giving for the support of missions around the world, and th that's what this is about. And now, let's put our focus on receiving what God wants us to receive. You can give in the ways that are indicated up here on the screen, but let's get our hearts and our minds in a position of receiving because ultimately that's all we can do in order to be in right standing with God is to receive his grace, to receive his goodness, to receive the benefits of the sacrifice that he made. 
And that's what we're going to do with the Lord's Supper. If you don't have the elements, just raise your hand. And I think we have somebody, yeah, somebody back there who will come down here to the front and get those to you. You don't have to be a member of Victory Church. You don't have to be a member of our denomination or anything. If you belong to the family of God, you belong at the table of God because it's a family table. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God is faithful. He keeps his promises. He passes the test. And through the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, the Lamb, Jesus, we have healing for our bodies. Receive that right now. Through that sacrifice, we have healing for our souls, for our emotions, for our broken spirits and broken relationships. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, we have healing for our spirits. We were dead in our transgressions, but because of what Jesus did, we're alive forever. Take the bread. Let's remember that this is a part of becoming the family of God, the family of the descendants of Abraham, the family that God promised Abraham that we would become from all nations, one family. That's why Paul says, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the same loaf. Then he said, the bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Let's eat together. Let's take the juice. Paul says, the cup of blessing for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Jesus. Let's drink together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who've made decisions today. We thank you, Lord, for enabling all of us to grow in our faith in you, our trust in you. And Lord, whatever you ask of us, we say, yes, Lord, here am I. Bless us, Lord. Make us a blessing. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Light, it shines in the darkness, reaching every heart with joy, hope, and peace. And this Christmas Eve, we celebrate the child who was born, the son that was given. We invite you to experience the story and the songs of the season with carols and candlelight, because Jesus is the light of the world. Don't miss Christmas Eve at Victory with special live performances on Thursday, December 21st at 7 p.m. and Sunday, December 24th at 10 a.m., 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. Well, if you made a decision for Christ today, we want to know. Please follow the prompts on the bottom of the screen so we can get a Bible in your hands and get you connected with your next steps of growth track and baptism here at Victory Church. Have you planned your Christmas Eve yet? Go ahead right now to getvictory.net slash Christmas and take a look at all the options like our online service and register yourself for a box where we'll send you the tools to participate in that Christmas Eve service. If you're going to be in the area, we'd love to invite you to join us here for Christmas Eve services, the first of which is Thursday night, December 21st at 7 p.m. And then we'll have three services on Christmas Eve here in person at 10 a.m., 1 p.m., and 4 p.m. on Sunday, Christmas Eve. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next week.